So today uh, we are here with Stephanie Norander for uh, a CXD webinar on scaffolding for success. Uh, my name is Lynn Wall. I'm with the Center for Teaching and Learning. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Stephanie. Stephanie, are you there? Great. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you so much, Lynn and the CTL, for hosting this webinar today. Um, we are excited to have this group here, especially after um, a disrupted um, semester. Um, thank you for coming back strong and joining us for a webinar this morning. I hope that all of you are doing well um, with the events over the weekend. So today's webinar is called Scaffolding for Success. And we are going to talk about one of what I call the common buzzwords in higher education today, and that's this um, notion of scaffolding. And we hear a lot about scaffolding and sequencing. I know that um, I hear these words thrown around a lot and oftentimes stop and pause and say, wait a second, what do we really mean by that? And what does that actually look like in practice? How can we break it down so that these become useful um, practices in our teaching and not just something that we give lip service to um, or talk about? So that's what we're going to do today is talk about what it means to actually scaffold student learning. So our webinar today has a few objectives. Um, we will define scaffolding and then identify the benefits of scaffolding. and our end goal is for you to walk away with some strategies for how you might scaffold learning in your class. Um, this is more than likely something that you're already doing to a certain extent, and this might give you some ideas for how to carry that further or deeper or to try perhaps a different strategy that you haven't tried before. And so we will be walking through, um, talking about what scaffolding is, why it's a good idea, what the benefits are of it, and then getting into, like I said, the very practical, how do I scaffold an assignment? So let me preface this by saying these are short 30-minute um, webinars. So of course, we are scratching the surface here. There are a lot more examples as well as research that we could go into on student learning and happy to provide you with additional resources, consultations, so on and so forth. There's also many different variations of scaffolding, and we're going to talk about a narrow set of examples today. I ask you to please you know, raise your hand, as Lynn talked about, or type a message, chat at any point during the webinar. If you have an example you would like to share or a question, just as we go, feel free to do that. I think we all benefit when we share examples with each other. And even if we say, you know, I tried this and it didn't quite work the way I expected. Um, so please know I'm open to that. And I'll also um, plan to save some time at the end for questions, but you're welcome to type something here as we go. Lastly, I just want to mention that today we're talking about scaffolding in the context of a course. Um, we can also talk about scaffolding in the context of a program, of scaffolding your curriculum. That's a different conversation, but I just want you to be aware that we talk about scaffolding on different scales in terms of whether we're talking about it at the course level or if we're talking about it at an overall program level. And today's focus will be mostly on the course level. Okay. Before we get started, let me just talk very briefly about communication across the curriculum. I see some familiar names um, in our participants today, and so some of you have heard this before. Um, for others of you who may be new, I think it's always a good idea to start off with sharing just a little bit of what our guiding principles are so that you understand what informs our approach to facilitating a faculty development um, session such as this. So communication across the curriculum is a, um, a resource on campus for faculty. We consult with faculty, again, at the individual level, sometimes at the department, um, program level, um, and even at the college level on talking about how can we incorporate and better integrate communication into student learning, no matter what the discipline is. And we're guided by a few principles on this, um, why this is a good idea. 
First of all, we know that research shows that our students really benefit when they have multiple opportunities to develop communication competencies. So not just in one class, but in several classes, and in particular in their discipline as well. Secondly, we know that in doing this and taking this approach, we're better able to foster deep learning, um, deep engagement with um, content area, and also facilitate student motivation, higher student motivation for learning. And then finally, um, we want to promote student success, not only in the classroom, but beyond. So we know, again, that students benefit not only in their classes when they are confident and able communicators, but also when they leave us and head out into their career beyond the classroom. So those principles are just by way of background to let you know what informs our approach to talking about faculty development. Um, you'll notice today that I will be using communication-based examples to talk about scaffolding. This is not, of course, the only area of student learning where scaffolding applies, but we will be drawing upon um, some communication-based examples, given these principles that I just talked about with you. Okay, so let's get into the what. Let's talk about what we actually mean by scaffolding. And I'm actually going to use two terms here, scaffolding and sequencing, because rightfully so, we often use these together and because they're intertwined processes when we think about student learning, course design, and assignment design. When we talk about scaffolding, we are talking about support structures. So I always get a mental visual picture of construction scaffolds, right, on the side of a building. Um, they are there to provide support for a temporary um, period of time, um, and they're to help us, right, um, tackle complex tasks that we couldn't do if the scaffolds weren't there. And so they break up for students these complex cognitive tasks into manageable chunks. They can also be thought of, I think, helpfully as training wheels in that they're there for learners for a period of time, but they are meant to be removed because ideally what we are promoting and fostering here is that our students become independent learners. We want them to gain confidence that they can do this on their own and then do um, ever more complex tasks as they go on. Now, sequencing is equally important. Sequencing deals with how we lay out a logical order, right, for asking for students um, to share their work, how we provide checkpoints, break up assignments, um, the timing of doing that, and again, the order in which we do that, that's equally important and deeply tied to scaffolding, um, thinking about how you might break up an assignment, say, for example, into multiple drafts so that students are getting a checkpoint, you are also getting a feedback on how is this going, um, may, might I need to introduce more scaffolds, right? Perhaps we're not quite getting this in the way that I thought we would. So those two concepts work together. Today we're going to focus primarily on scaffolding, but just keep in mind when we talk about scaffolding and sequencing, we're talking about two distinct yet deeply related processes. Okay, so continuing on what scaffolding is. Let's take a look at a visual model. This always helps me to have, to visualize it. Um, a good way to think about this is to start with what is it that students can already do? Okay, so if you're thinking about this in the context of your course, you know that students come in with certain knowledge, skills, abilities that you're expecting that they can already do. And we call this their foundational knowledge. Right? And we can be really, really specific here, in particular if we're thinking about this in the context of a, a specific assignment, and you say, okay, I would like for students ultimately to do this for their assignment, say it's a final assignment or a high stakes assignment. So what parts of that can they already do? Right? What do you expect them to come into your class already being able to do? And then think about what are the new tasks that you need to introduce them to um, that they cannot yet do on their own. 
Now, here's where things get um, a little interesting, right? Because we say, all right, well, I thought that they should be able to do that, or I'm not really sure if this is a new task. Um, they, you know, I know they've had these other classes. And so another good way to think about this, in particular if you're teaching a course in, a, in your specific discipline, so in the majors, when students actually get into their major, it could be very well that, yes, they've been asked to do this in a different disciplinary context, right? But perhaps they've not yet been asked to do it in this discipline. And so that could mean that I'm using a different vocabulary than what they've been exposed to. It could mean that maybe I'm using the same vocabulary, but it means something slightly different in this discipline. So that's really important to think about when you're teaching in the disciplines, is that a new task could be that students are being asked for the first time to do this in this context. And so that might lead to the need for a scaffold, which is provided by the instructor. Um, it's intentional, right? These are, they, they don't just happen in our courses. We have to be intentional about them and plan for them and tie them to those very specific tasks. And then we move on up and we say, okay, as a result of this, students should now be able to do this piece on their own, right? This very specific task task, and then they can continue to build on that. So if you take a look at this, what this shows for me is that this is really a process of getting very, very specific about if I look at this from a student perspective, if I look at the assignment, if I look at what I'm asking them to do, what are all the new tasks involved, right? And which ones might I need to scaffold? Okay, we're going to come back to how we do that. Any questions so far? Allow me to pause for just a moment. Okay, we will continue on. So why do we do this? Why is scaffolding a good idea? Well, there are many benefits to scaffolding. Um, one is that it promotes clarity and direction and expectations, right? What is it that we are specifically asking students to do? It can also be an important way of offering feedback that, again, clarifies expectations. So if I have scaffolded an assignment throughout the semester, for example, because I know that where I want to take students is a pretty high level, and so we're going to have to introduce these new tasks intentionally and carefully, and I'm going to have an opportunity to provide feedback. I'm also getting feedback from my class on how they're doing on this, um, and they're getting an opportunity to understand the expectations, not just at the very end of the semester or not just in a one-off assignment, but throughout. Um, they're getting an opportunity to understand what those expectations are. It also focuses learners on very specific goals, right? So this makes it very concrete. I want you to be able to complete this task on your own. I want you to be able to do this, right? And here's why, because we're going to build on this. So it focuses them on specific goals rather than feeling overwhelmed by, oh my gosh, I have this huge project due, it freaks me out, I'll just stay up a couple nights and get it done, but I don't really know what I'm learning, right? I don't really have an understanding of what the specific goals of this are. It also creates momentum, and we know that this is really important um, in a semester system that, you know, we, it's, of course, all of us, we are momentum ebbs and flows, as does our motivation throughout the semester. And so by building in very specific, concrete learning scaffolds, what you do is you give students an opportunity to build confidence in accomplishing small tasks and a confidence in their own abilities to do that. And that, in and of itself, building that confidence then builds momentum. Um, so that I feel really confident by the time I get to that final version or final project, um, whatever the case might be, um, that I can do this. And then again, it 
facilitates deep level learning and higher level competencies than would have been achieved without scaffold. And part of the way that it does this is that it makes it very explicit for students as well as for you. Here is what we're trying to accomplish, right? Here is where we're going with this. And it helps students see that and understand, okay, I have an understanding of, yes, I, I learned, I progressively learned how to become a stronger critical thinker, for example, or to be able to analyze. And I was able to see that laid out by the way that we approach these different tasks and by the way that they grew in complexity and perhaps by the way that I grew as a student in my learning um, and development. Okay, so now we've talked about the what and the why. Um, let's talk about the how. Okay, so I've talked about scaffolding in terms of being progressive um, and that you're leading students somewhere, right? So Bloom's taxonomy is um, something that many of us are familiar with, a tool, right, that helps us understand learning. It's certainly not the only one, um, but I share it here as a way to think about this idea of scaffolding in a progressive manner. Um, so if you think about, again, in the context of your course, students are being introduced to the subject matter, right? Perhaps if you're a, teaching a course that's early on in their major or one of the very first ones that they may take in a discipline, this could be the very first time that they're introduced to this content area. Um, and the same could hold true if you have a special topic or a specialty area. So keeping in mind that we are starting with right, introduction to this area, that forming a foundational baseline level of knowledge to this content area um, is probably where a lot of our courses are starting to a certain extent, right? And oftentimes, our goal is to send students all the way to the other end of the continuum to where they can synthesize and evaluate. Um, and again, the scale of that will vary. It depends on discipline. But there's a lot of steps in between there. And so we need to take that into consideration as we think about how are we introducing the subject matter and the tasks that we're asking them to do. And the idea here is that you introduce them to a subject area slowly and start with the less complex tasks because they're, they're grappling with being introduced to this new area as well as these tasks. And then you can slowly build on that because over the course of the semester, they're becoming more comfortable, more familiar with the subject area, understanding the content area, the kinds of questions that you're having them explore, and so on and so forth. And so you can introduce them to more complex tasks. So again, this is not showing you Bloom's taxonomy. This is not the end all be all of how to do scaffolding. Rather, it's just a good resource to remind ourselves, oh, okay, if I'm asking students to synthesize and evaluate, hold on a second. Have we covered knowledge? Have we done comprehension? And also thinking about in an extreme scenario, if all I've asked students to do all semester is demonstrate that they can repeat and list and define terms, but all of a sudden at the end of the semester we have this high stakes assignment where I'm expecting them to critically evaluate text and write up their analysis, we've done nothing to prepare for that. We've provided no scaffolds to prepare them for that or to lead them up through that. So this could be a helpful tool just to kind of have to the side, a helpful visual to think about, all right, what, what are the things I'm actually asking students to do? And that's where we're going next with this, is talking about how do you actually use this? How do you put this into practice? Well, one way to do this is to take an assignment that you have developed for your course um, or a course, a, 
it could be a fine and when I say the final assignment, I'm talking about the end product, right? What is it that you want students to do? Um, and work with that description and the requirements that you're asking of students or that you're sharing with students. And then just make a list, okay? And again, this is where Bloom's taxonomy may be helpful to kind of have to the side, um, where you list. In order to do this, right, in order to complete this assignment, what are all of the skills and the knowledge and the abilities students have to be able to demonstrate in order to complete the assignment. And this can be really eye-opening because you'll probably have a full page, right? You'll probably go, well, gosh, I guess in order to do this, they have to understand what I mean by a scholarly article, right? And they have to be able to read that and so on and so forth. Um, so just listing all of the things students would have to be able to do. And then in the next step, this is where you get back to that, remember that earlier visual of, all right, what are the things that students should already have as foundational knowledge? What are the things they should be able to do, I can reasonably expect that they're able to do um, or have been introduced to before, right? And what are the things that are new tasks? And so you're highlighting the new tasks. Right, circling them, highlighting them, saying, okay, more than likely, this right, this part of the assignment is going to be a new task for a student. Either it's a new task in this discipline or it's a brand new task they've never been introduced to at all. And then you have to do some prioritizing, right? It's impossible to scaffold absolutely everything in an assignment. Um, but prioritizing based on your prior teaching experience and working with students, based on what you know about your field and your discipline and what they're going to be asked to do again and again, um, and what are the things that are the building blocks that if they can't do this well, they're not going to be able to do any of this further things or the more complex tasks well. And so that kind of gives you a clue to what are the high priority skills and abilities that I need to focus on and need to scaffold. And so once you pull those out, you can specify exactly, okay, we, I, I think we need a scaffold for this particular skill. So I'm going to develop one to match this skill. So you are probably picking up on a common theme here because I keep using the word specific and concrete. Scaffolding is all about being very specific and concrete about the specific task that you're scaffolding and then the specific scaffold that you're going to offer. It's not an ambiguous concept, again, that just happens kind of magically. You have to be real intentional about it. So let's take a look at an example. And again, I am, this is an example that may or may not apply to your discipline. You can plug in what works for you. Um, so this is a brief assignment description of what I call an academic literature review. We all know that that's going to look differently for each and every one of us who are on this call. Um, what I call literature review may look very different from what you call literature review, or you may not even, this type of assignment may not resonate with you, but you can plug in something that does. Um, and so if I say, all right, the description that I give to students is write a literature review that synthesizes seven to eight academic research articles on one of the five main areas that we cover in this class. And I sit down and I really brainstorm, okay, that's the end assignment, that's the end goal, that's where I want students to get to. What are all the things they have to be able to do? That would be a really long list um, in order to do that. But then I break it out and I say, okay, but there's, here are my priority areas, right? First of all, I recognize that in order to write that literature review, they're going to have to be pretty adept at reading and comprehending academic sources. And so perhaps, because I know in my experience with this particular course, students struggle with this. Um, they have a hard time with just being assigned reading, but not ever really talking about what it means um, to have different reading strategies. So we're going to have some direct instruction on that. And then I'm going to build in a very low stakes type of assignment to check their comprehension. Notice that Bloom's taxonomy word, right? We're checking comprehension. Not just are you reading it, but are you able to summarize it in a way that shows your comprehension. 
I'm only going to do that early on in the semester, even though we have lots of readings planned for the semester, because remember, a scaffold gets taken away. The idea is that, okay, we've done this, there's a specific scaffold, and now we're building confidence that you can do this on your own. And so on and so forth. You can see the other examples there. Another thing that they're going to have to be able to do is identify purpose, audience, and conventions. So here's, again, in my experience, academic literature review has many different meanings depending on the discipline. It's also a genre that tends to be quite foreign um, to students. And so I'm going to start off with talking about what is an academic literature review. The important thing to keep in mind here is that I'm not going to do this as separate from my content. I've already got readings assigned. I've already got the content area, right? And so I'm going to use that content area to talk about this, to talk about what a literature review is. This is not separate from my content. I'm not taking days out of or away from teaching content. I'm using the content to say, okay, you know, we're reading literature reviews. You're going to be working on one for the semester. Let's talk about what this is. Let's talk about today's reading and talk about what it is. And then lastly, I pulled out here that this word synthesize, right? This can have very different meanings depending on disciplinary context. And so I can expect that my students, right, are being asked to do this for the first time in this context. And so we need to provide some direct instruction on this and do some drafting to get them comfortable with this idea of synthesis and what the expectations are for that in my course. This is merely an example. I can't emphasize that enough. You can do this with many different types of assignments that work and fit within your discipline. Okay, so we're running out of time. These always go quite fast. Let me just wrap up with mentioning that um, we are more than happy here at CXC to provide you with support in terms of individual consultations. We'll be happy to sit down with you with, to take a look at your course or particular assignments if you're interested in talking about scaffolding or other areas of focus. And then we also have a whole menu of resources that we provide for faculty at the department level, um, as well as at the individual level, depending on the different courses that you're teaching. So if you have any questions, if we can be of help in any way, please let us know. We have another webinar coming up on November 14th. My colleague, Dr. Heather Bastian, will be talking about creating and designing group communication assignments. And that will also be hosted by the CTL, so keep an eye out for that. And with that said, we have just a few short moments here. Um, I'd like to turn it over to you as the participants and see if anyone has any questions or ideas um, or challenges that they'd like to share. Okay. Well, thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. I wish you a very um, healthy and um, smooth um, running semester from here on out. If we can be of assistance in any way, shape, or form, don't hesitate to email. And if we're not the right people, if you have a different kind of question, we will make sure that we get you to the people who can help with your question. But I hope that you were able to at least learn a little bit about what scaffolding is specifically, why it's a good idea, and how you might go about doing it, um, and perhaps deepen your practice of scaffolding that, like I said, you may already um, be doing to a certain extent. Thank you. Have a great day.